I like books, but sometimes books can hurt us in ways you never would have thought imaginable. Sometimes they can frustrate us, make us sad, make us angry, maybe even bring out a little rage. I firmly believe you don't truly understand the kind of person that you are until you read a book and its ending breaks you, makes you say things and do things you never would have thought imaginable. Be warned, all of you, against the books that may break you. But in all seriousness, this is my list of books that had endings that just frustrated me or disappointed me or made me angry in some way. I do think that books have a unique way of getting under our skin when they don't live up to our expectations or they do something that just irks us in some way. I also want to clarify that in no way am I trying to attack the authors of these books. Writing books is hard, and far be it from me to throw hatred at these guys just because they wrote stories that I found disappointing. By the way, there are going to be spoilers for all of the books that I'm talking about on this video, so once I say the book title and you want to read that book for yourself, be warned there will be spoilers. Also a quick reminder, don't forget to like and subscribe if you want to see more. I post new videos every Saturday, and feel free to leave a comment on what book endings really made you upset. So I hope you enjoy me ranting about the book endings that broke me. The first book ending that really upset me comes from The Shadow of the Serpent by Rick Riordan. This book is the final book in the Kane Chronicles trilogy. The Kane Chronicles is set in the same universe as the Percy Jackson series, but whereas that series is based on Greek mythology, this series is based on Egyptian mythology. The story of the books follow Carter and Sadie, who are teenagers who discover that their parents are magicians, who are able to influence and interact with the ancient Egyptian gods of that mythology. Throughout the series, they fight the different deities of Egyptian mythology, and the whole story is building up to this big climactic battle where they have to fight Apophis, the big apocalyptic serpent who's going to swallow the sun. I read this series a few years back and really enjoyed it at the time. It wasn't quite as good as Percy Jackson, in my opinion, but even so, I thought it lived up to the name of that series pretty well and was a decent follow-up. Also, the fact that a large chunk of the first book takes place in southern New Mexico, where I grew up, just made me really happy. All of this conflict culminates in The Shadow of the Serpent, and overall, the book itself is pretty good. It is a serviceable finale to the trilogy. It wraps up all of the characters' stories very well, except for one. To kind of set the stage, throughout the trilogy, there is this budding romance between Sadie, our secondary protagonist, and Anubis, the Egyptian god of death. And from the get-go, I was already not a fan of this relationship idea, given that Sadie is like 14 or 15 years old, and Anubis is a millennia-old god who just transforms himself to look like a teenage boy so that he can, I guess, interact with Sadie in a more normal way. It just never really sat right with me to begin with. One, because of the age difference, and two, the fact that, okay, she's mortal and he's immortal, god of death, like, is this really the kind of guy you want to be going for? But anyway, I was like, whatever, Let, let's just keep going with the story. Then in book two of the series, they introduce Walt, who is just a normal guy who is also a magician, like Carter and Sadie, and he's kind of more of the nice guy trope in this love triangle that's being formed, whereas Anubis is that stereotypical, like, goth bad boy, which was pretty annoying to read, to be honest. 
Also, I should probably say that I have never been a fan of love triangles to begin with. I find them very annoying and just a very cheap way to try to engage the reader and it's never been a trope that's engaged me. I don't know if I can think of a single example of a love triangle that I enjoyed or got something out of, so I'm already upset. But in the previous books, that was always kind of a side plot. It was never the central focus of the story, so I accepted it for what it was. Like, okay, some readers get stuff out of love triangles. No harm, no foul. And then we get to book three, and the way they resolve it just blew my mind of how crazy it was. Basically what happens is in the big climactic final battle, Walt is mortally wounded, and at first it appears like he is going to sacrifice himself for Sadie, she's gonna go off to be with Anubis, and that's how we resolve our love triangle. And I'm like, okay, not the most creative way, not the most necessarily safe way to handle that, but you know, it is what it is. But then what happens instead is Anubis, the god of death, possesses Walt's body, and the two of them share the same body. And at the conclusion of the book, Sadie is dating Walt, but also Anubis is sharing Walt's body, and they cut to showing the spirit realm, and you see that Sadie is walking alongside Anubis at the same time in the physical world she's walking alongside Walt. So we resolve our love triangle by giving the girl both guys. And I'm just like, ah, oh, oh no, <laughs> no, 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 why, why are we doing this? This is so weird. This is so creepy. I don't. <laughs> and look, I get it. It's a young adult novel. It's not meant to be the, the messages that you live your life by, but it just left such a bad taste in my mouth. Also, I feel so bad for Walt. Like, he's such a nice guy, and now he's got to share his body with the god of death and share his girlfriend with him, too. Like, what the heck? <laughs> it's like the worst possible fate. It's like, okay, just let me die at that point. Jeez Louise. So, at the end of the day, Shadow of the Serpent was a pretty good novel overall, but just that ending, that is like the most memorable thing about the book that stands out in my mind, because just the way that love triangle was resolved was so strange and icky and just like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing this in a book that children are going to be reading? It's not a terrible ending. It's just one that really irks me on a personal level. Next up is Revan by Drew Carpishan. This book is under the Star Wars Legends brand, which is the old canon of Star Wars that existed before the Disney buyout. When I was a kid, I loved the Star Wars books. Just any that I could get my hands on, I would just eat up in terms of reading them. I'm still a big Star Wars nut, and I'm still going to be working my way through the Star Wars new canon books on this channel. All of that to say it's a series that's pretty near and dear to my heart. And with this book in particular, I was really interested in reading it because Revan is the protagonist of the original Knights of the Old Republic video game. He is one of the best characters in the old expanded universe of Star Wars, and I love the Old Republic setting. So I was really eager to see how his story would be continued in this book. And what makes this book so frustrating is that for 90% of it, it was fantastic. Basically, the story follows Revan, who has now settled down with his wife. He starts to receive visions that there is a brewing darkness out in the far reaches of the galaxy. And so Revan leaves his wife and his unborn child to go on this quest to discover the evil that is lurking out in the edges of the galaxy, to put an end to it once and for all. It's a really great story about Revan having to go confront his old demons, to confront the man who turned him to the dark side to begin with, and 
put an end to his reign of terror. Along the way, Revan meets up with his old apprentice, Mitra Surik, who is the protagonist of Knights of the Old Republic 2, and the two of them team up to go take down the Sith Emperor. On the way, however, Revan is captured by the Sith Lord Scourge, who is kind of the secondary perspective character throughout the story. Throughout the book, you see from Lord Scourge's perspective the inner workings of the Sith Empire, and it's a really great build-up over time of you see Scourge slowly start to become more and more dissatisfied with the way the Sith work, with the way they're handling things in the galaxy. And when Revan is captured by Scourge, Revan, through his wit and cunning and just his, his personality, is able to convince Scourge, you know, if we teamed up, we could take down the Sith Emperor. There's nothing saying that we can't. And finally, after all of this time in the book, Scourge turns to the light, he joins up with Revan and his apprentice, and he goes together with them to confront the Sith Emperor to defeat him once and for all. What ensues is this epic climactic battle where Revan, his apprentice, Lord Scourge are all trying to kill the Sith Emperor, and it's a really cool fight. And then the ending happens. Basically what happens is that in the middle of the fight, Scourge receives this vision that shows him that they are going to lose the fight and that there is no way for them to beat the Sith Emperor. It's kind of similar to the Doctor Strange moment in Infinity War where he realizes that there's only one possible way for them to defeat Thanos. But what happens in this story is as soon as Scourge gets the vision, he ignites his lightsaber through Mitra Surik's chest, killing her instantly. This character that had been built up over an entire video game dies without a word in an instant. And immediately after that, Revan is defeated by the Sith Emperor and is just knocked unconscious. Then Scourge is made the right hand of the Emperor, who gifts him immortality, because apparently the Sith can do that, even though that was supposed to be a secret that was lost. Ugh, I love the Old Republic, but it also breaks the Star Wars universe in so many ways. And then Revan's fate is that he's basically sealed inside this containment unit for all eternity, being tortured by the Sith, who are trying to get information on the Jedi from him and Revan is stuck in there for hundreds of years. So his wife, an unborn child who he left and that he promised to return to, never see him again. And then there's this whole epilogue at the end of the book where Revan's like great-great-great-granddaughter is like, oh, I wish I could have met my great-great-grandfather. And it's just like, ugh. don't get me wrong. Books can have dark endings. Books can do things that shock you, that subvert your expectations in clever ways, but this just felt like shock value for the sake of shock value. And to have a character like Revan, who has already been so tortured throughout his life, just be confined to this hellish fate of being tortured for all eternity by the Sith, so much so that you find out in the DLC for the Old Republic that he was tortured so heavily that his mind split in two between his light side and his dark side. He goes insane from the torture that he is receiving. And at the end of the day, the book just simply existed to set up the plot of this DLC for the Star Wars MMO game. And I'm like, why would you write a book just to set up video game DLC. That is the most unsatisfying way to tell a story. If you were going to tell Revan's story, maybe you should have told it within just the books or just the video games, instead of splitting it between the two so that when you read the book, you're dissatisfied at the end. This book is really good. And that is why it, the ending just killed it for me. I think this was my first time being really disappointed by the ending of a book. I can't think of another book that I read at that age where it 
really just caught me off guard. And again, books can be shocking, books can have dark tragic endings, I'm not opposed to that, but if you're going to do that, it needs to be in a way that makes sense for the character. Nobody wants to see the good guy die or suffer this horrible fate for no reason. I, I think that was the thing that bugged me about the ending the most, is that Scourge just sees this vision that they're going to lose and immediately assumes, well, I guess this is going to happen. Boom, I'm going to stab my friend in the back. Like, it it happened so quick. Like, <laughs> we made a split-second decision without thinking. Like, people get mad at Luke for thinking for one second that he might kill Kylo Ren. This moment is so much worse because Scourge actually goes through with it. And then they try to do this whole thing at the end where Scourge is like, I did what I had to do, and maybe one day I will betray the Emperor successfully. And it's like, but that, that was your best opportunity right there. You had no guarantee that that vision was going to be reality. And again... No hatred towards the authors. I think Drew Carpishan is a great writer. He did a great job on the Darth Bane trilogy. I hear that the Mass Effect books are good. And he apparently did his own young adult fantasy series. But this ending just did not work for me at all. Overall, for Revan, it's still a good book, and if you're really invested into Star Wars lore, I'm sure you'll get something out of it. But the way it ends just really put a bad taste in my mouth and just soured the whole experience for me. And at the very bottom of the list comes the ending that truly broke me, and that honor goes to Armada by Ernest Cline. This book has the worst ending of any novel I have ever read. And I know that may sound a bit mean to say, but... Of the books that I have read, I have not been more baffled, confused, by any other ending but this one. Basically, to give the setup to the book, it's about Zach Lightman. He's a high school kid, your average normal gamer 80s loving guy who discovers that aliens are about to invade Earth and that there's been this whole secret government conspiracy that apparently the government has been using sci-fi movies and video games to train children on how to fight space aliens. Yeah. So it's kind of an out there premise to begin with. It it kind of feels like nerd wish fulfillment where it's like, oh, all those years of studying Star Wars are finally gonna pay off. <laughs> now that trivia knowledge is gonna help me fight aliens and save the Earth. So anyway, Zack Lightman is a fantastic gamer, and because of that, he is able to pilot these drones that all these other kids and cadets use to fight the oncoming alien onslaught. The book kind of slowly builds up to this big, epic, climactic battle where Zack and all of his friends are confronting the aliens and... People are just dying left and right. Like, literally, I think, like, half the characters in the book die in this big battle. And it all leads up to this dramatic emotional scene where Zack's father sacrifices himself in order to give his son the opportunity to defeat the aliens. And in the end, Zack succeeds. He blows up the big... I forget what it is. He blows up a big thing that shuts down all of the alien ships, and he saves the Earth. Pretty conventional standard ending. But that's not the true ending. All of a sudden, this alien probe approaches Zack and tells him that actually the alien invasion was just a test to see how Earth would react to an outside threat. Because of Zack's actions in defeating them successfully, it means that Earth is worthy to join this big alien space empire. And so the aliens give Zack a choice. He can either choose to allow Earth to join this alien empire, or he can choose to continue resisting, in which case the aliens say that they will inevitably win. They've just got too many numbers, too much superior firepower that humanity wouldn't stand a chance. Also, for some reason, the scenario is set up to where only Zack can make the choice about Earth's fate, 
he can't consult with the United Nations or any of the other presidents or leaders of the world. The aliens specifically say, like, well, because you defeated us, you have to be the one to make the choice for your entire species. So yeah, the fate of the universe rests on the shoulders of a 17-year-old Star Wars nerd. I'm just gonna leave it at that. And at this point in the story, I thought, okay, this is clearly leading into a sequel, because Zack is going to say, no, we're not going to join your alien empire. It doesn't matter if you try to enslave us or say that you're going to wipe us out. We're going to fight to the last man. And so I thought he was going to say no, and that it was going to be set up for a sequel. The aliens will be like, we'll get you next time, and they would fly away, and it would set up for a sequel where they would come back and, and all of that. And that's not what happened. Instead, what happens is Zack makes the choice to say, Okay, we surrender. We'll join your empire now. And that's how the book ends. Oh. It, it literally left me dumbfounded. I was like, are you kidding me? So, all of your friends died. Your dad died for nothing. If you had just seen the aliens to begin with and said, Oh, we surrender, we'll, we'll join your empire, then all of this could have been prevented. What was the whole point of this war if you were just going to surrender? And what makes this even crazier is that the book frames this as the right decision. That somehow Zack was making the wise choice for joining this alien empire. This empire that is now going to forcibly subjugate Earth to be a part of this greater society. This is framed as the good choice. And then on top of this, there's this little extra thing at the end where, where they say that Zack is like, Oh, well, we joined the Empire, but I'll become the representative for Earth, and I will go to the aliens and make sure that they never betray us. And it's like, you already put the Earth in a position where they can do anything they want to us! It felt like one of those endings where, on paper, maybe you could make it work. Maybe if you built up more of the idea that the aliens were actually benevolent, that they were here to help us, or that maybe humanity was the true aggressor and so they needed to make peace between them, it doesn't have to be all war, violence, and bloodshed. Maybe it could have worked. But from the way it stands, the aliens are the aggressors in all of this. They set up this huge contest or test for humanity, and, and then they just take us over at the end. Our entire species is subjugated to an alien race because of a 17-year-old Star Wars nerd. And this is framed as a good decision. What kills me, too, is that the, the author specifically said that this is a standalone novel, that there are no planned sequels for it. So it's not even like a thing where it's like, oh, we leave off with the protagonist making this really terrible decision, and so it sets up for future books. No, this is the the true ending of the story. Like, could you imagine if Independence Day ended with the president, instead of giving this big rallying 4th of July speech, just said, well, you know what? Maybe we should just join with the aliens, and then they won't blow up our cities anymore. It is kind of a fascinating book from the stance of it had an interesting enough premise, it had some likable characters, but man, did that ending really drop the ball. And to be clear, this is not the worst book ever written. It's, it's not anything like that. It's just got one of the most baffling endings that I have ever read. So for now, that is my list of all of the book endings that broke me. I'm sure the list will grow longer <laughs> the longer I read and the more videos I post on this channel. But anyway, I hope you enjoyed and feel free to comment down below on what book endings really disappointed you. As always, thank you for watching and I'll see you in the next video.